500 million and buckaroos. Still a considerable haul, even these days. Could even get your deposit on an Auckland section. Let alone in 1978 when the average income in New Zealand was about 30,000 a year. The large offer now on the table of a retired Christchurch engineer and his investors was in line with its potential in the world market. In hindsight, a bit light. In the hegemony of world beating inventions to come up with, short of a perpetual energy machine, an alternative engine that ran on just plain H2O is right up there. That market had seen Western countries in the 70s now being faced with fuel shortages and climbing prices. Economies were now being held to ransom by OPEC. This spawned a rush to locate viable domestic oil deposits in the likes of the North Sea and following that around New Zealand thus reducing the dependency on OPEC. Being at the very end of the supply chain and totally dependent upon overseas oil, New Zealand was unprepared and particularly vulnerable to the oil crisis enveloping the globe. In a drastic and somewhat amusing futile move, in 1979 the national government's knee-jerk solution to the crisis was to mandate all car owners to nominate one day of the week their car would have to stay in the garage. Only, there was now a Kiwi in our midst, Archie Blue, with a simple solution to the number one economic problem facing the country. No longer would New Zealand, or any other country for that matter, be reliant on the Middle Eastern oil producers. And what's more, at the same time, an engine that ran on water would reduce the country's oppressing overseas payments and balance. Double whammy. This was seen as an economic godsend was taken seriously by politicians of the day, and debated in New Zealand's Parliament, investigated by the then Ministry of Energy. It goes without saying, a car that ran on tap water attracted overseas attention, and Archie was no slouch when it came to the business side of things. This wasn't the first thing he'd patented. He wasn't going to be taken advantage of. There are other locations on the planet with a tax rate a trifle lower than the marginal rate in New Zealand at the time, a whopping enterprise stifling 50%. If he was going to become New Zealand's richest man overnight, at 74 I must add, he was going to keep as much of that dosh as possible. One of those tax havens overseas was, and still is, Guernsey, 4% tax at the time. Before I get to the display of the car on the Channel Island, one the whole world was watching, let's delve a bit more into the life of Archie Blue up to this point in 77-78. As I've just touched on before, this wasn't the first groundbreaking invention of the entrepreneurial Blue had a crack at. Over four decades and since the 30s, he had a well-worn path to the local patent office, hoped to finally crack one commercially. His venture started all the way back in 1939, when as a 34-year-old, he and a mate came up with a way of improving television reception. In that era, before cassettes and tapes, he came up with a method of recording sound on wire. Yep, just plain old steel wire, travelling to the US to promote it. Then there was a design for a radio slash stereo speakers, none of which went anywhere. Then he hit on an improvement for electrical switches, which did. He sold the patent to a US company for a pittance. Not nearly enough to retire from his engineering job at the local electrical department. Breaking water into oxygen and hydrogen wasn't even his most shadowy invention. There was another one. He expended a lot more time and effort on, so hush hush, he was sworn to secrecy. I couldn't get to the bottom of it. It was so commercially lucrative and groundbreaking, he was whisked off to New York by investors in the mid-1950s and parked up in a secluded location in New York to perfect it, despite four years overseas trying to make Product X viable, and plainly he couldn't. From all of this, you'll see Archie Blue was a true Blue Kiwi battler. Well into retirement, he was someone like me, and pottering around on YouTube, 
him in his shed as a hobby and not the money. Early in the piece, and let's put the conspiracy theory to bed, that Archie Blue's engine was suppressed by large oil interest with plenty to lose. Archie never hid his electronic fuel cell invention. There was, of course, the patent is staring back at you. Anyone with enough interest could access it. For the technologically inclined, I'll link to a video on how it worked in the description. Openly drove around Christchurch streets in his distinctive yellow Mini, powered by water. Appeared in 60 minute like features on the telly and of course as we've seen on the front of newspapers. From the outset he had his detractors and clearly some of those came from the aforementioned Department of Energy. Contradicts a fundamental scientific knowledge. Was their blunt assessment in November 77. In August of 78, Archie was on Guernsey Island. There, his three backers had organised a trial along with a neutral in the form of a Royal Automobile Association officer to oversee proceedings. The notoriously harsh British press were there in the form of a Daily Mail journalist to run his eye over the Leyland Mini as well. The vehicle joined other islanders on the roads and got what you would have to say was a pass mark, despite the ear blower packing a sad and putting pay to the demonstration 30 kilometres in. The Daily Mail journo, Michael Kemp, was rather impressed. Next stop, Iowa in October, where investors and motoring industry representatives had assembled for a demonstration. Blue had made the lofty claim he'd drive his car 300 miles across the state on 8 gallons of water. That demonstration didn't go well. That was because one of his bags containing part of the kit went missing on the airline and invited guests were on a schedule and weren't in a mood of hanging around. So Blue, he strung things together as best he could with what he could dig up on short notice but the US venture ended up in disaster and he headed back to Christchurch knowing he had work to do to convince people. It was easy to spot Archie's home along his Sprayden Street, a retired bloke who clearly spent more time in the shed tinkering than say mowing the lawn and doing the gardens, best known in the neighbourhood for making and selling garden ornaments. The local press was soon quizzing him on how the engine was boxing along after his much vaunted overseas trip. Amongst the background of one of his Guernsey backers dropping dead and another forced into a retirement home. Undeterred, it was a goer as far as Archie was concerned. Plans were afoot to launch a new local company, raise £100,000, no idea why it was in pounds by the way, with an IPO. And what's more, just to show you things were bubbling away in the background, he just entertained representatives out from the Iowa Tools Making Company. It was proceeding as far as he was concerned. Skepticism began to mount as to the viability of Blue's invention. And the professor heading at the local Canterbury University Chemical Engineering Department stated, Contradicts fundamental scientific knowledge. Where have I heard that before? And that's where the story ends, or more correctly, peters out. Go on, you already knew the ending as soon as I started this one. Archie Blue is not a household name, lauded as one of New Zealand's greatest ever inventors. Mind you, most Kiwis wouldn't be familiar with the name David Strang either. And that Southlander came up with instant coffee and the mocha. Despite the efficacy of his engine, or lack of it, it would have been nice and somewhat fitting for Archie to have received some financial reward for all his efforts so late into his life, one he faded snugly back into. After 1980, he chose not to talk about the engine, went back to creating hand-painted garden gnomes. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs were his big seller, a sure winner.
And don't forget, for those interested into the concept, i.e. how things work, thinking about having a go, creating a free energy machine at night instead of watching Coro Street, take a look at the video on getting to first base that's in the description. And at the same time, automatically cutting me in 5% royalty as a finder's fee. Thanks to those that give me a positive feedback, tell me where I go wrong even. It is appreciated. I will spot you next time. Not even I know what I'm up to next, probably the one about the white witch. Bye for now.